and I will start with our introduction. Get us going. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Scholar Talk event, Intellectual Journey. I'm Tanya Sansel. I'm one of the board members for Intellectual. And for those of you who may not be familiar, um, Intellectual Inc. is a nonprofit organization that promotes reading, media literacy, digital citizenship, academic achievement, and self-improvement in the Houston, Texas community and beyond. So just want to make a quick acknowledgement of our board members that we have with us today. We have Dr. James Stansel, Tanya Stansel, myself, Gavin Stansel, Tony Garrett, Mr. Pat Rump, and I don't think we have Dr. Justin Washington. He's an, another one of our board members today. So our intellectual journey scholar talk theme for today is Texas stories. And it's going to be featuring scholars who have written about African Americans with Texas origins or African American experiences in Texas. So let me introduce our featured scholars for today. First, we have Max Fockmall, who is an associate professor of history at Texas Christian University. He studies coalition building among African American, Chicanx, Latinx, and white community organizers across the long civil rights era, which spans from the 1930s to the 1980s. He won the Organization of American Historians Frederick Jackson Turner Award in 2017 for his book, Blue Texas, The Making of a Multiracial Democratic Coalition in the Civil Rights Era. Today, he will discuss his new book titled Civil Rights in Black and Brown, Histories of Resistance and Struggle in Texas, scheduled to be released in November, 2021. We also have with us today, Teresa Runstetler, who is an Associate Professor of History at American University. And her re research examines Black popular culture, focusing on the intersection of race, masculinity, labor, and sport. She will discuss her book on the Galveston giant, Jack Johnson. And the book is titled Jack Johnson, Rebel Sojourner, Boxing in the Shadow of the Global Color Line. And then also with us today, we have Tawana Steptoe, who is an associate professor of history at the University of Arizona. She teaches and researches race, gender, and culture in the United States. She is a Houston native, and she will discuss her book titled Houston Bound, Culture and Color in a Jim Crow City, which received the Kenneth Jackson Award for Best Book of 2016 from the Urban History Association the 2017 W. Jackson Turrentine Book Prize from the Western History Association, and the 2017 Julia Ibsen Award from the Friends of the Texas Room at the Houston Metropolitan Research Center. So welcome to all of our scholars, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. We're really looking forward to learning more about your work and any upcoming work that you have and just having some stimulating conversation. So uh, the moderator for today is, is going to be Mr. Pat Rump, who serves as our Vice President of Operations for Intellectual, and as I mentioned earlier, he's also a member of our Board of Directors. Pat will moderate the discussion with our guest scholars. We welcome um, folks who have questions to post them in the chat, and we'll do our best to have the scholars answer them um, as we go through the conversation. We also will leave time at the end for an open Q&A session. Um, so at this time, I'm going to just stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Pat, who will get us started with today's discussion. Okay. Thanks. All right. Thank you so much, Tanya, for that, that wonderful introduction. Um, thank you to all of the participants, scholars, and um, individuals that are going to be watching this. Um, on our YouTube page, the Intellectual YouTube page. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. So let's go ahead and just start here with a very, uh, very um, brief introduction in terms of um, your background and walking us through how you got into what it is that you do today. So let's go ahead and start with Teresa. Um, could you tell our audience a little bit about yourself and uh, walk us through how it is that you became a author and scholar? 
Oh, geez. Um, let me just give you the short version. <laughs> um, I'm originally from Kitchener, Ontario, Canada. So um, I'm a Canadian living in the United States now for 20 years. I can't even believe it's been 20 years. Um, but growing up in a very monocultural city, I ended up moving to Toronto to go to York University. And there it was just like a whole new world was opened up to me because there were actually people of color <laughs> in Toronto. Um, and I went to a very large public university. And I remember in my final year of studies, I took a course called African American History um, from 1965 to the present. Um, and I was just completely blown away by the civil rights history that I learned, um, black power history, um, and learning about social movements that addressed questions of racial inequality, gender inequality, class inequality. I'd never really had an opportunity to think through those questions um, outside of the classroom. And that was the one space I felt um, as a university student that other students of color, lots of immigrants, um, students who were sort of on the margins of the university could use those readings and those philosophies and um, examples of activism to think through our own lives in the context of Canada. Um, and so I ended up leaving uh, university graduating and wasn't sure what I wanted to do. So I ended up becoming a professional dancer for a while because that uh, I had been trained as a dancer. That was the easiest way for me to continue to make money. Um, I actually danced for an NBA team, um, the Toronto Raptors, uh, during college and after college. Um, while I was trying to figure out what in the heck I wanted to do. And of course, my parents were sitting at home thinking, is she going to get a real job at some point? So I segued into media and I got my first job um, working at a, a sports network, a national sports network in Toronto doing their public relations and ultimately realized that I didn't want to continue on in the corporate world and in media that I wanted to study media, I wanted to study that history, and I thought back to that experience in the classroom, which was so formative for me. Um, and I thought, well, where can I, where can I learn more about this? And I figured out that I would have to leave Canada <laughs> to learn. Um, and the original goal was to go to the US, study, then bring all of that knowledge back to Canadian universities and try and build some programs there um, so that students wouldn't feel so isolated and so um, outside of, you know, the culture of the university. But I, you know, doing a PhD takes a long time. And I ended up building a life over here. I got married to an American. So I'm here. Um, now I'm I'm tenured at American University, so I'm here now. Um, but, you know, so my journey was a little bit circuitous, but uh, kind of like Jack Johnson's in some respects. But certainly, um, I've always been very passionate about thinking how, thinking about how African American history is actually, um, I don't want to say universal history, but it's a history that we should all be learning about regardless because it speaks to so many of the issues of our day. Um, it speaks to the character of the United States as a nation and how we imagine ourselves past, present, and then also what kind of a nation we want to have in the future. And that's always the the sort of perspective that I come from. But that's that's a little bit of, a, of my background. So if you ever think that, you know, you're not really cut out for academia, I certainly was not the one who had this straight, easy path. Thank you, Teresa. And, and, you know, it just goes to show, like, whatever you're passionate about or whatever direction you choose to um, set for yourself, you, you truly can achieve it no matter what it is you decide to do or whatever you try to uh, try in life.
Well, that's that's awesome, though. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and kind of segueing into media, um, Tawana, let's let's hear your story because I know that you uh, studied a little bit of media in your earlier years. So could you walk us through, um, you know, all the early and, and talk about are you from Houston? I am. OK, so let's let's find what high school did you go to and walk us through how you got to where you're at today? OK, so I was born and raised in Houston. I spent my very early childhood in the Clinton Park neighborhood. And then when I was oh, about to start kindergarten, my family moved to the North Shore area. So I graduated from North Shore. And now that community is very known for its football team. They've had a lot of success in the past decade, won a state championship or two. But back then, nobody knew where North Shore was. <laughs> when I would tell people I was from there, I would just get a blank stare from other people in Houston. So now the community is a little bit more well known and it's changed a lot. And the changes in North Shore, I think, helped inspire the book that I wound up writing about Houston and wanting to tap in to the diversity of the city, which was something that I wasn't learning when I was in college. I went to University of Texas after I graduated from North Shore. So I moved up to Austin and I was first a radio television film major. I was in the School of Communications and I went there sure that I wanted to make, you know, big Hollywood movies. But then, uh, you know, the early 90s was around the time that there was this explosion in independent film. And so you had a lot of black urban stories being told by a lot of young filmmakers from across the country. So in the 90s, you know, people were talking about Spike Lee or movies like Daughters of the Dust and Boys in the Hood. So film seemed like it was this place where black storytelling was happening and you didn't need to go the big budget Hollywood route in order to do that. So I think that's kind of what inspired me to get into radio, television, film when I was an undergrad. But when I was there, I started realizing that maybe my form of storytelling wasn't fiction, even though it was fiction narrative film that got me into the study of it. I got really into nonfiction when I was in Austin and just kind of fell in love with documentary filmmaking. and. At the same time, I started for my electives, I would take all these history classes. So when I got to choose what I wanted to take, I would end up in classes. I took African history. I took the whole sequence of African history, took African American history. And I was talking to an advisor a few years before I graduated, and she was looking at my transcript and she says, you know, you almost have enough history classes for a history major. Do you really love history or something? And I said, I do. And I was using content that I was learning in my history classes to make short documentary films for my radio TV film major. And there were a few others of us who were like that too. We liked documentary, we liked telling historical stories. And then, you know, somewhere along the way, I decided to go to grad school because I realized I just wanted more. I wanted to know more of the history. I realized how little I actually knew from taking the classes. Like, wow, there's this whole world out there that I didn't know about. So I wound up going to graduate school to an interdisciplinary program in African American studies. Since my background was interdisciplinary, I had the communications. And I had the history, so I felt like an Afro-American studies program would allow me to keep exploring both sides of my interests. I did wind up going into a history program for PhD after getting my master's. And, you know, the way that I wound up staying in touch with media was I wound up getting into radio when I was in grad school. And that continued to be something that I always did alongside writing my dissertation is I had a radio show when I was in graduate school. And now here in Tucson, I have a radio show here in the city as well called Soul Stories. 
that explores the history of rhythm and blues music. So I feel like I've been able to keep a foot in communications and a foot in academic history, which is something I started as an undergraduate. So if blazing your own trail was a person, you would definitely fit that mold. You you took, <laughs> you know, um, your circumstances and your love for what you wanted and you kind of created your own lane, which is amazing and which everyone who's a trailblazer tends to do because um, we all don't fit the, the typical mold for this or that. So um, I, I just love your story. Thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you. All right. So let's move on. Uh, Mr. Max. Um, you're in the like uh, Fort Worth area, TCU. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, let, let's let's find out about a little bit more about you. How did you get um, into the role that you're in now as an author, scholar? As and let, let's let's start from the beginning. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for having me today, and it's great to be here with with friends and, and new friends. Um, yeah, so I'll try to be brief too. I, I uh, in listening to the others, I'm, I'm trying to pull out the key points here, right? And I guess I grew up with stories of history in front of me and stories of civil rights in front of me and of uh, social change and, and, and organizing. My my grandparents were Jewish radicals in the old left, and they I, I I grew up knowing about these strange stories about people like Paul Robeson, who you know would come through their house when he was in town. And, I didn't really know what that meant. Um, <laughs> and it took me a, quite a while later. Uh, I went to college at UC Santa Cruz and um, I, I majored in an interdisciplinary field called community studies that was focused on, on organizing and social change. And um, I uh, <clears throat> kind of got to tie my love for history with um, really applying it in terms of being out in the field doing that work. Um, and uh, and also some documentary studies. So it's neat to hear about uh, both of you working in media. Um, so yeah, and, and then I became a union organizer. And so I was working in the labor movement in California and um, got to thinking about how our union had really struggled to um, meet the needs of our members right, when they weren't at work um, and, and how the intersections between um, work site labor issues and community issues and things like fighting racism and fighting war were not always things that we were talking about um, and, and our members wanted to be talking about them. And, and so I um, at some point thought, well, I, I, should, uh, I should go to grad school and then I can read a little history and see if there's something we can learn from the past that we might be able to put to work today in terms of organizing uh, across racial lines to fight racism and to fight, um, I guess, capitalist exploitation. And, and um, so that led me eventually to, to looking for a place that tied together my experience on the West Coast with um, this interest I'd had for many years in the civil rights movement in the South. And that led me to find Texas as a sort of historical laboratory of where formal Jim Crow South intersected with what I call Juan Crow in the Southwest and, um, and allowed me to think about Mexican American history and African American history in relation to one another and in relation to uh, to organize labor and other sort of radicalisms. And so that led to my first book called Blue Texas, uh, which I got to share with some of uh, the intellectual crowd uh, some years back. Um, and then and then now the current project, which is focused on oral history. Um, and so, yeah, I was really excited when I landed a job at TCU in Fort Worth and could actually be close to the people I was researching and, and working with in solidarity. and being close to many of my written archives as well, and also being able to apply what I was learning about history uh, very much in the present, uh, you know, through constant engagement with, with contemporary social movements as well. Um, so yeah, that's the short version. And um, yeah, it's great to be here with so many smart people. Uh, and I'll top you, uh, it, it's, it feels so great to be in the presence of, of so many smart people, I'll, I'll tell you that. Um, <clears throat> So your work brought you to to TCU. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, as a as a spinoff question to that, um, let's talk a little bit more about your your book that's going to be uh, coming up here. Uh, what uh, what was your motivation for adding this uh, this well, this labor of love? Because from <laughs> what I understand, it takes a lot. Not a little, a lot of time, research, uh, endless nights, 
oral history like you like to uh, that you talk on sometimes um, to come up with all of this information and not only this data this information but scrubbing it so it makes sense to the masses tell us a little bit about your upcoming book and, and the motivation behind writing it sure yeah thank you um, so the the book's called civil rights in black and brown and it's um, it's more of a collaborative volume than a traditional edited collection in that uh, my my colleagues and I did this research together and wrote this book. And um, so the motivation was that I, I had come to TCU and I was starting to teach um, courses where I was teaching oral history methods to students and taking them out into the community uh, and, and beginning to try to learn the history of, of the black freedom struggle and of uh, Chicanx, Latinx movements in, in our city and beyond. Um, and I learned quickly that those stories just hadn't been documented and there were assumptions that these struggles had never existed even in some places. And so I started to reach out to uh, other colleagues in the area and friends and, um, uh, you know, there were a couple other people who had done some oral history work at UT Arlington and at University of North Texas where my, my co-editor Todd Moy is based. And, um, and so we started putting our heads together about how we might start conducting oral histories and sharing this massive amount of labor of, of trying to document uh, and, and create a historical record um, about civil rights struggles very broadly defined uh, in our cities in North Texas, but really across the state. You know, we knew that um, many activists who, who had done this work, um, you know, had never written it down. They didn't have uh, an office or an administrative assistant to keep their records. They didn't end up in archives. And so we thought it was important to, to try to, to get their stories on tape, to document them and thereby you know, democratize the historical record as a whole. Um, and so we started thinking about how to collaborate and eventually that led to us applying for a, a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities um, to go and do this field research. And, um, and also to think about how is it that we what do we do once the interviews are conducted, right? That so often oral history interviews, even though method, very often the interviews end up lost in a library somewhere and, and they're difficult to access or difficult to work with. And so we were imagining new forms of, of collaboration and of, of dissemination, uh, of spreading the information and making it accessible to ordinary people. And so we, um, with those kinds of goals in mind, we ended up hiring a whole bunch of uh, graduate students from all over the country and uh, doing oral history methods workshops with them. And then we spread out across the state and um, over two summers did full-time field research for several months. Um, myself and three other faculty directors were, were out working with our research teams in different cities from, you know, everywhere from, uh, from Beaumont and um, Tyler to Amarillo and El Paso and Brownsville and really everything in between. And uh, over the course of a couple summers, we conducted 500 plus interviews. Um, and, and then we each wrote about the places that we had done research in. And so we ended up with this anthology of sorts with case studies of uh, the intersecting black and or brown civil rights movements, um, as well as you know, some excerpts from, from the interviews and some other pieces there too. Um, but the motivation, I guess, was the question, right? The motivation was we didn't want this history to die with the people who had made it, right? Because they didn't save records, because they weren't being preserved, right? Because it's difficult for folks of color to be represented in archives, period. Um, we, you know, we knew that these stories were there and we didn't want them to, to pass away with the people who'd made this history and made this change. And so we wanted to find a way, you know, to collaborate and, and, um, and, and, and get them get them out there and then get them out into the world, which we built a website where we, we broke the interviews into little clips. Um, and each clip has its own metadata, its own uh, catalog information. And that hope we're, the goal is that it makes it much easier for people to have access to the type of information that they're looking for in their hometown or wherever. And, and that's, Recording that's is on. Important. That's, that's very, very important, um, <laughs> accessibility um, and, and the ease of getting that information. Um, just speaking on my own generation, it's like, if it's not fast, if it's not quick, if it's not easy, uh, why should I waste my time doing it? So um, that that shows that you all thought about that quite a bit.
in, in creating this project. So um, um, thank you for that. Well, and I'll just say quickly, they're all videotaped too. And that was sort of the same reason we figured that's how yeah. people like to communicate today. So we, yeah. we, uh, we made videos <laughs> of varying quality, but we tried. Hey, brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> I'm a visual person myself. So myself, I can, I can appreciate that uh, very much. So I, I thank you, sir. <laughs> Um, so same, so same question to, um, Tawana, and you, you mentioned that you went from your, your ideal fiction to nonfiction. Uh, so can you tell us, um, a little bit about the, um, the Houston bound, uh, writing that you came up with? Um, and I'm especially, um, especially interested in, in hearing about it because I, I just um, not too long ago I had a conversation with um, Zion Escobar, the executive director of the Freemanstown Conservatory, and they are in the process of um, making the, the the travel the Houston bound from from the, the Juneteenth uh, understanding of the the emancipation of the the enslaved individuals and the route that they took. So they're going to make that route. Um, uh, uh, um, untouchable in a sense, like it's it's going to be preserved as a historical site. So um, please tell us a little bit more, because I'm very interested to know a little bit more about um, about the motivation behind your book and and what it was that uh, you wanted audiences to um, to get from it. I'm really happy to hear that they are retracing that route you know i think that that would be very interesting a way for people to have that history feel very tangible and real to them to follow the path there but you know when i went to graduate school i realized when i was taking history seminars that a lot of the books that were written about african-american history really focused on a kind of black and white color line. And of course, the history of white supremacy is a major part of the racialization of people of African descent. So it does make sense that, of course, that would be something that we talk about. But I kept thinking that the experiences with race that I had growing up in Houston weren't represented. And I, I still had this question of, well, what about a place like Houston that is so diverse? And today people say Houston may be the most diverse city in the United States even. And so I wondered how a city like that segregated its population. And I used to listen to the stories of my grandparents, great aunts and uncles and everything talk about growing up there. And they used to talk about the, you know, colored seating signs and all the Jim Crow segregation signs that they grew up with there. So that's what kind of sparked it. I thought, well, when did the Latinx population of Houston begin to grow and what went on with them? So that's kind of the, the little question that was in my head when I first went to grad school and started taking courses. And of course, back then, you know, we Max was probably labor organizing <laughs> at the time. So I, I didn't have a lot of books that talked about that. So when I would look at books on the history of Texas, even, I noticed that you had books that were about a sort of Anglo-Mexican color line and a black-white color line. And there was one book that my Western history professor assigned, Neil Foley's The White Scourge. That was the first book I read that tried to put these histories together. And he focused on Central Texas, where the Jim Crow South, and then as Max said, the Juan Crow Southwest are meeting right there in Central Texas. So that was the first book I, I noticed that was doing that kind of history focused on Texas. And it's why I thought Texas had a unique story to tell in the history of segregation and something I wanted to pursue. And I, I realized there weren't a lot of books written about text, about Houston in particular. There were some local histories that were out there, but then again, nothing that I found that was putting these stories together. Another thing that was part of my upbringing as well as my grandparents, my grandparents are from Fifth Ward and they lived right near the community called Frenchtown. 
And so I had grown up with my grandparents. When they would talk about race, they would say black and French. They would say, oh, yes, Wheatley High School, when we went there, was a mixed school, black and French, you know? <laughs> and so I thought that also was the story about Houston and Texas that hadn't been told either, which was the Creole of color population. And so those questions really led me to looking at migration because I realized that early in Houston history and then following the Civil War, Houston did have a very black and white racial dynamic that probably felt a lot like other parts of the South. And it was around World War I that you started getting these migrations of people coming to the city that kind of shook up that racial binary. So I started looking at the movement of different groups of people of Mexican descent. I looked at Tejanos who are Texas born Mexican people, as well as Mexican immigrants who were coming in to the country for the first time. And realizing that even between those groups, they had different ideas about what race meant because they'd grown up in different societies. And then with Creoles of color, they were French speaking, Catholic, frequently mixed race population who were coming in to the Fifth Ward community. They were bringing ideas about race, especially the meaning of blackness. That was a bit different from other black Texans. So I thought that if I looked at migration and started around that period of World War I, then I could answer some of those questions I had about when did the city start to change and to diversify. And, you know, I'm glad that Max talked about oral history because that really became one of the main ways that I could get at that history because I wasn't finding sources on this that talked to one another in the libraries and in the research centers there in Houston when I would find oral histories that some of the archivists had conducted, they would talk to, for example, uh, Mexican Americans in Houston and focus in on questions of how they related to the larger Anglo population of Houston, but they wouldn't ask them any questions about how they related to Black Houston. And I knew from growing up there and looking at maps that some of these communities were right next to each other. So I thought there's no way that the people living in Second Ward, which they were calling Segundo Barrio, there's no way that they had no interaction with the people of Fifth Ward right across the bayou. So there had to be, at least they had to be thinking of one another. And I was sure that Black Houstonians were part of the racialization story or people of Mexican descent, but the sources in the archives weren't talking to each other and they all but ignored the Creole history. You know, so it was a, a difficult study to take on an oral history, going into the communities and talking to people became one of my main methods. All right, thank you for that. And yeah, we are certainly gonna get into that just a little bit more in terms of like the methodology that you all used um, and also like the process, like the, the, the length of the process for individuals who, um, who, who may aspire to follow the same path. So we're gonna get in that in just a moment. Um, Teresa, <clears throat> so, I am very interested, uh, someone from Canada and going into Toronto, um, finding a very interesting uh, in character, an individual as Jack Johnson, as you as you coined in your book, the, the, the rebel sojourner. Um, I, I would love to hear the, the why behind this uh, piece that you did. And, and can you tell us just a little bit more about that and, and, and the why behind that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I was like trying to jot down some notes so I could try and organize my thoughts because I could talk about so many different things. But I think, you know, I was very interested in studying black internationalism, um, uh, social movements, the uh, dissemination of African American culture, um, not just in North America, but across the globe. And also thinking about something that historians call the global color line. So all of the measures in place, whether it be immigration restrictions or Jim Crow segregation, 
um, um, apartheid, all of these different um, systems used to segregate people of color um, in different places. Um, and because, you know, I was coming at this from the perspective of somebody who's a quote unquote foreigner, um, for me, I was really interested in how does African American history, um, how do um, particularly black celebrities, um, as their image and as their new news of their accomplishments travels to different spaces, as they travel to different spaces, how does that impact the conversation about racial segregation, about imperialism, about colonialism in different spaces? I was really interested in that, partially selfishly, because I feel like Canada is often left out of these conversations. And, you know, from my experience growing up there, we always talked about racism as being an American problem. You know, it was very convenient for us to sort of say, well, you know, that's an American issue. Um, and we can point to all of these moments in US history that have become sort of internationally recognized, the civil rights movement, black power, even before that, um, the history of slavery to sort of say, well, you know, we're not quite like that. That's where the real issue lies. But I felt like there was another story to be told. And I wanted to try and find a vehicle um, that would help to show how these ideas about blackness on the one hand and also about the need to preserve white supremacy, um, you know, were traded and disseminated across across borders. And um, Jack Johnson, when I started reading his um, his autobiography, um, I was just blown away by the fact that here is this young man who grows up in Galveston, Texas. You know, he he has a sense that there's a bigger world out there from the get go because of growing up in a port city um, where he's able to see the ships come in. And there there is a little bit of racial fluidity. Um, that he experiences on the docks. He was he was a worker on the docks. And that really kind of impacted his view of his own possibilities um, and the sense that in order for him um, to expand his life chances, he actually had to leave town. He had to go out and explore, whether it was by ship or by, you know, railroad, he had to be on the move. Um, and as I dug more into his story, I realized that he wins the um, world heavyweight title in 1908 in Sydney, Australia. But even before then, he had to go abroad to fight, uh, you know, the the prominent white fighters of the time because he did not have access to those fights within the United States because of the strictures of Jim Crow. Um, and then once he, you know, gains this title and then fights against the und quote unquote undisputed world heavyweight champion Jim Jeffries and also um, beats him in 1910. He gets convicted under the Mann Act under, you know, trumped up charges of bringing white women across um, state lines for the purposes of prostitution, um, which he was incidentally pardoned by Trump, which is just a bizarre turn of events um, from my perspective. But anyhow, what I found was that he spent so much of his career abroad. So I was like, OK, well, we often think of him as this figure who, you know, speaks truth to power within the Jim Crow United States. But he spent the vast amount of his career actually outside of the United States. So I wanted to go to those places like uh, London, England, Paris, uh, to Sydney, Australia, or even even if he didn't travel to South Africa, what you know, what was um, you know the reaction 
of native Africans in South Africa to Jack Johnson, this guy who is beating white champions at a time when this was just not acceptable under narratives of social Darwinism and white supremacy. Um, so when I started to just, you know, scratch at the surface, I began to find all of these reactions to him and reactions to him in, in other places where they began to talk about their own quote unquote race problem through the lens of Jack Johnson and what his success might do to inspire uh, resistance among people of color that they were you know, colonizing in different spaces or how that might disrupt their own notions of um, white supremacy. And so there was this whole other story. But needless to say, I mean, part of what I wanted to get at, I mean, I have this background in entertainment and media and sports, was to actually take seriously somebody like Jack Johnson, who was an athlete, but he also talked a lot in the press. He wrote his own autobiographies to take him seriously as somebody who had you know, some thoughts about the world because of his experiences traveling to different places and confronting, you know, white racism in all of these different contexts and to sort of take him um, and, and uh, explore him as an intellectual, you know, of sorts. Um, and to sort of see how also too through um, sport, ordinary people, began to think through these larger, more complicated questions about solidarity across borders. What does it mean to be part of the African diaspora? What does it mean to be a, uh, you know, a settler <laughs> um, in, in um, you know, Australia? What does that mean in terms of one's racial identity? Um, and I think, you know, part of your question was, what did I want? folks to take away from the book. Um, I wanted to really show through an accessible story, the story of one man in a larger context who's part of this community of, you know, essentially just entertainers, boxers, laborers, just trying to live their lives. Um, and they, you know, their experiences really show us that racism is fundamentally structural, it's institutional, it's connected to capitalism, it's connected to imperialism, racism um, is global. Um, and that, you know, through their stories, we can begin to contextualize uh, the American story of race within a global, uh, you know, a global frame. And then also show that there are all of these submerged histories of solidarities, non-white solidarities across borders that we tend not to think about. Um, and certainly even somebody who was a boxer from Galveston um, was really thinking through, what is my significance on the world stage as somebody who disrupts um, all of the racial etiquette in different spaces? Um, so really just to try and tell that story um, using, you know, maybe to sort of also bring folks into these conversations who might pick up a book about boxing, but might not want to pick up, you know, really sort of heavy, dense, theoretical text about musings of internationalism and you know, academic jargon, but to actually tell it through the story of these fights um, and everyday people's reactions to them. So I, I hope that I achieved that, but certainly it comes from, it comes from a lot of, the impulse to do this project came from a lot of different places, um, but mostly to just sort of disrupt our kind of notions about ourselves and really point out the interconnectedness of stories of anti-blackness in a global context. Okay, well, thank you for that. And, and I actually have two spin-off questions, one, one that's in the chat um, and then one of my own. So, uh, so after all of your research um, uh, on Jack Johnson, 
is coming up and, and with your interest in sports, do you have a better appreciation for the sport of boxing as a whole? Yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> incidentally, I actually um, knew a bunch of boxers because the weird thing about Kitchener is that we actually had some of the Canadian champions ch training in um, boxing gyms in Kitchener. So I knew folks who were boxers um, and who um, were really, you know, really sort of their own journeys through the sport of boxing. And often I find particularly in my profession of um, academia, people are sort of like, Ugh, boxing like it's so barbaric it's horrible you know how could you condone this but on the other hand you know it and, and other other folks have written about this much more extensively it's just a space for you know i construction of identity of the, you know community of um you know of of camaraderie and so you know, for me, I try to take boxing and any other sport that I look at through the eyes of the participants rather than imposing some kind of value judgment about why people are doing it or what the dangers are. And of course, we know about head injuries and whatnot. Um, but to really sort of take seriously um, boxing as something that's not just about what happens in the ring, but it's also about the formation of communities beyond the ring as well. Um, so I'm not sure if that really answers your question, but um, I think often scholars, and I, this speaks to, I think, the marginalization of sports history um, in academic circles will often think of um, anything that is done with the body, <laughs> you know, to make money um, and sort of be like, oh, there's nothing to analyze there unless we're doing it, you know, from the perspective of what we can read off of their bodies rather than sort of thinking about what the athletes actually thought. Were, were they, you know, through their experiences, espousing new ideas about the world that they confronted. And that's really the stories. Those are the stories that I'm interested in telling. Definitely. Thank you for that. Okay, so let's let's backtrack here. Because um, I wanted to ask this question to you. Um, true to what I was saying earlier, Tawana, um, it seems like there, you've, you've been influenced in more ways than one in your career you know, taking a different pathway in, in terms of your um, uh, decision to go from uh, fiction to nonfiction and also on how to start your research. So picture this, all, all the scholars on the call today, and this is gonna go, this is the question for all of you guys. You're brought to your nephew, your nieces, your cousins, uh, bring a, a, a professional to work day and a student is an 11th grade junior who wants to know what are the best practices for doing research and how how long can I expect to do research uh, for uh, for a book? Like I don't even know w what am I looking at here? I'm I got prom to worry about. I, I got my the rest of my life to look at. I mean I don't know if I want to commit to this. So what would you tell that 11th grade student in terms of best practices for research and how long can they expect to do that research for a finished product, Tawana. Yeah, that would be a tough question to get from someone and to answer without discouraging them from the process. Because, you know, honestly, it, it will probably, from start to finished products that you can hold in your hands or read online, it could take a decade. I think that for many of us who undertake historical research of any kind, there's the the process of figuring out what your questions are and then figuring out where the sources are, how you're going to get there, where are the archives. Um, if you look at newspapers, that can take a very long time too. It's one of my favorite parts of the research process is digging through historical newspapers and reading uh, what was in there. I always get sidetracked by looking at the comics 
from any newspaper that I'm looking at because the things that people find humorous can tell you a lot about a society, even though it's not part of the project, I'll always get sidetracked or, you know, conducting interviews with people and then you have to get it on paper and write it down and then there's editing. So historical research typically isn't the kind that you can jump into quickly and have a finished product. And that was something that I had to keep explaining to family and friends back home who would say, hey, where's that book? Weren't you writing a book at some point? <laughs> I see you, Teresa and Nick <laughs> right? Uh, we probably all got those kinds of questions. And then, of course, when you find a publisher, right? If somebody wants to help you get this product into print, they may have things that they want you to change. And uh, with historians, you know, we typically go through the peer review process where they send the manuscript out and you get feedback and then those reviewers let the publisher know whether or not they think that this is a viable project so then that's a whole other part that you have to go through so there are multiple rounds of revision even after you have finished writing the entire manuscript they have to go back and revise it again so i first started my dissertation in 2005 i held houston down in my hands in 2015 so exactly 10 years from when I started the research for it. And I think for a second book, you know, uh, the projects that I'm working on now, they can sometimes go a little bit faster because you know better what you're doing. You know what to do when you get into the archives and, you know, you're bringing that prior experience to it. So it's a little faster, but here I am now six years into my second book. So it's looking like that might take 10 years as well. So I don't know if uh, if a junior in high school would want to hear that, if I would actually encourage them <laughs> to go through it. So, you know, what I always say is what someone told me is that you have to write what you know and write what you feel passionate about because this has to sustain you, has to sustain your interest for a really long time. And you know, when I say write what you know, obviously we have to go out and do the research, but what I can hear in all the stories from today is that there is something personal that we were involved in that got us into our projects. For me, it was writing about my hometown and not seeing a lot written on my hometown, even as it was coming a bigger, bigger city. Uh, for Teresa, that international angle coming from you as a Canadian seems like it's something that was probably very personal, you know, and having growing up in a place where there were boxers always around, Max being a labor organizer, you know, so I think we all bring a piece of ourselves into the projects and that's also what can help sustain you when it's year eight and you're thinking, I'm still writing this book, <laughs> you know, having, having that, that personal investment in it is what kept me going. So I see everyone's kind of like laughing, nodding their heads. Max, tell us some comparisons, some some similarities, uh, compare and contrast. What what are your thoughts? Well, uh, I think Tawana knocked it out of the park, right? Like that's exactly very similar to my experience. It's a decade in the making, no doubt. And, and this newer book, we started in 2013 and it's coming out, you know, in a couple of weeks here. Uh, and that was with a bunch of people working on it, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think everything Tawana said is right on. Um, I guess I would just caution that at the same time, you know, anybody can be a historian, right? Like the, there's one path to becoming a professional historian, to getting your book published at the peer-reviewed academic press, right? But, um, but you know, that junior in high school can go out and, and interview their grandmother, right? And, um, and use that as a source to then go back to the archives, to go to ancestry.com, to go to the local library, um, to go and research other secondary books and articles that have already been written about a subject. And, you know, they can produce a, a website, right, where they have a, an essay and they have clips from their interview and scans of the documents. And you can do that in a semester, right, and and produce something that I think actually makes a huge contribution, um, you know, in terms of the larger field of human knowledge and what we as, as professional historians draw on as we try to piece together these, these longer, more... Um, intricate, you know, monographs. So I, I would say, you know, go and do it. And, 
And if you get hooked on doing it, then you might find yourself in grad school, right? And when working on a 10 year project, but yeah, it's no, it, you know, it's slow. Um, you know, I, I think about this a lot in this current moment where our, our wider culture is starting to try to um, reconcile a little bit with the past, right? Things that we didn't talk about before George Floyd are now being talked about in cities and universities. And, um, and everyone wants us to just tell us the history, right? Tell us what happened. Like, well, that, it takes a long time <laughs> to dig that up and be able to tell you what happened. Uh, but we can always start and anybody I think can, can contribute to that process. Yeah, definitely. And, and what I take from that is, you know, what you can tell somebody who's younger, just like, hey, start where you're at, you know, talk to the people that you have access to already and let that really be the uh, the jet fuel to take you to the next level. Because, you know, you might in from Tawana's story, he's like you, you wake up, you say, hey, this is really interesting to me. And then before you know it, five years, six years has already gone by. It's like, wow, that much time has gone by. But you are you know, I guess working in your passion, you're working on something that you find generally interesting. So, um, yeah, thank you for that, Max. Uh, Teresa, any similarities or comparisons to what Tawana and Max has said? Definitely a lot of similarities. Um, I think I was like going, yes. <laughs> I was trying to do the calculation and I think I, I started Jack Johnson, Rebel Sojourner in like 2003, and it came out in 2012. So like, I think academic books tend to have a certain gestation period, <laughs> right? Um, no matter how fast you think you can move, there's always things that, uh, that need to be done. Um, the current book that I'm working on, I really sort of started it I started it in bits and pieces back in 2015, but really sort of started working on it, working on it in 2018, and I'm hoping it comes out in 2023. <laughs> we shall see. Um, but it is, it, it does get a little bit easier to conceptualize the whole project once you've done it before. Um, but just like some other things that I think are really helpful that I've learned from writing, I'm writing a trade book right now. So I've been working with an agent um, who uh, it's gonna be coming out um, from bold type books. It's actually a, a history of African-American basketball players, uh, pro basketball players in the 1970s and how they reshaped uh, professional sports and pro basketball. Um, I Both on the court, in the courts and off the court. Um, but anyhow, one of the things that I've learned from that process is that sometimes, you know, you just have to start small. So you take the little thing, the one little thing that you know that you can write about, and you just write one little piece. Maybe you can write one paragraph. And in fact, um, and I, I know that there's youth probably watching this, but I am in a group, um, a writing group called One s-h-i-t-t-y paragraph <laughs> one shitty paragraph at a time and literally all we do is we say okay my goal this morning when i wake up is to write one terrible paragraph and if i can do that then i can do it and i think sometimes writing is it's as much a, a mind game a mental game with yourself as it is actually the process of writing so you kind of just have to allow yourself to be vulnerable um, and and just do it. Just write something. Um, you can always clean it up later. You can always make it sound pretty later. Um, it just put something down on the page. And I think, you know, what has helped me as a writer is to have uh, like multiple accountability groups um, who sort of nudge me and I can check in with them and tell them what I'm struggling with and they can help me think through how to approach the next section that I'm working on or how to fit things in um, into my busy day. Um, and I've particularly learned this now that I'm I'm also a mother of a four-year-old that uh, sometimes you just got to wake up at 5.30 in the morning and that's the only time that you will have to write that one terrible paragraph. Um, but writing is, it's just like any other kind of training and 
you know, I was a dancer before. Um, I did a lot of competitive sports. If you're in that world, you know that you have to train. You can't just show up to the game or show up to the performance and then all of a sudden, you know, produce something. You got to do a little bit and keep that, you know, keep that um, skill really fresh. And I think sometimes, especially for, you know, the students that I encounter in my classes or just sort of thinking about how I approached writing when I was in high school and college, it was all just about writing to the deadline. And I think now that I'm older and I just can't pull an all-nighter anymore, I <laughs> just can't physically do it, I've learned that it's just a little bit, a little bit, and eventually it turns into something, but it's just like training. You got to get on your, you know, get on your exercise bike and you got to do it, you know, every day or three times a week and make it a regular part of your life. And you'll be surprised at how much you can accomplish, even if you just did half an hour a day. True, truly. That's a that's a good segue, uh, Teresa. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm going to ask this next question to Max as we explore that a little bit more. So I want to talk about analysis paralysis, right? I want to talk about how important it is on setting these mini goals, whether it's writing one paragraph, one crappy paragraph uh, a day, an hour, whatever. Um, let's talk about like, how do you keep yourself on track and not get paralyzed with all the data and all that stuff that prevents you from executing and coming up with um, your product and executing your goals? Let's talk about a little bit about that, Max. Um, what are some strategies that, that you use to kind of help you get over that hump if you ever come to that? <laughs> Um, gosh, that's a great question, and I wish I wish I could say I was as disciplined as Teresa is, um, but I'm not. <laughs> I, you know, I, um, I I find like I, I end up binge writing, right? I end up, uh, um, you know, just kind of it becomes all I'm doing, and I get surrounded in papers and stickies on the wall, and and just hack 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 away at it. Um, I guess for me, what keeps keeps me going is that I I just find so many opportunities. Um, to talk to people about this history, right? That I, I am invited to go speak somewhere in the community, uh, or I'm teaching with my students, um, or I'm in, in involved in a social movement where uh, they're asking questions about history to inform their their present work, and um, and so that for me really does I think keep me motivated at, at saying, man, this 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 piece of paper I found in an archive has some really powerful stuff in it. And I need to do the work of, of synthesizing it or unpacking it and getting it out into the world. Um, yeah, so I, I think I, I avoid paralysis in part because I feel some, I don't know, I guess some responsibility, um, especially when I interview people, right? That, you know, um, during that 10 year period, I was working on, on what became Blue Texas. I remember I almost quit lots of times <laughs> and, um, you know, and and for various reasons. And And I think in the end, uh, you know, one of the reasons I was excited to come to Texas full time and, and um, one of the reasons I really wanted to see the book through was that these people who had shared their lives with me, um, I thought it was important to get this text out into the world. And also, I, I hoped it would be a text that could help, you know, present and future activists, um, you know, avoid maybe some of the mistakes of the past, learn from some of the successes, even if they were temporary and then got crushed. Um, so for me, it's very much about maybe a, applying the work, right? That, that we have this, you know, um, as Obama would say, right? The fierce urgency of now, right? We we need to we need to get this information from the past out into the world, um, if we have any, you know, hope of saving ourselves, right? From from one another, from each other, from you know, in general, building a more just world. And um, yeah, I, I guess I would say that. So you know, there are moments when 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 it does pile up. Too much around you, I think, and 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 it's okay to take a break too. And I try to do that once in a while. Thank you, Max. And and Tawana, can you? Is there anything that you can add to that? Uh, maybe some strategies that you use to help push you forward if you get paralyzed by the data or information. Oh, and you might you might be on mute. <laughs> we got to make sure we get all this rich this rich information. Thank you for the reminder. I like to break things into smaller chunks 
you know, and with these books, you know, there's always maybe a piece of it that appeals to you more at one point than another. So I, I try to write what I'm feeling at the time, even if it isn't in chronological order, right? So if there's a particular question that maybe even resonates with what's going on currently, that might push me to really dig into one point of one part of the project. And what I mean when I say break things into smaller points, there are always, you know, side projects that I have that are related to the overall project. So like, for example, going and giving a talk somewhere, like even if it's a local community center, I get asked to come to talk to high school classes sometimes. So I'll take a little piece of it and go and talk to some people about it. And they always, Getting feedback from people always helps me stay in it and stay motivated. And it also lets me know what parts of it people might be interested in. So I don't wait for the final product before I get out to start talking about it and presenting it to people. I do this locally, like I said, community centers, high schools. I talk about my project on the radio when I can. And then there's the more formal way through academic conferences where you have your peers and colleagues asking you the more academic questions. But yeah, I also find that that talking to people who are not historians to see what they might be interested in most is one of the most helpful things for me. And so the project that I'm working on right now, for example, kind of came out of just giving a talk that someone asked me to do and then seeing how much interest was out there. And so, yeah, I think for me, uh, getting that feedback, that immediate feedback from people, it has been very, very helpful in terms of pushing the direction of the project. Awesome. Very and nice I see you. here, uh, James has a question for me. What does Houston bound mean? And uh, that uh, Houston bound is from a Lightning Hopkins song a blues song, Lightning Hopkins was a blues musician. He moved from Centerville, Texas to Houston and went from being a sharecropper to a professional musician and was part of Third Ward and a place that was starting to thrive because people like Lightning Hopkins moved there. And I, I saw Jesus' question there in the comments and it kind of related to what I was talking about in terms of finding ways to stay motivated and to keep pushing the story forward. When I started Houston Mail, and I wasn't even sure if music was going to be part of it. And it was listening to Houston's cast that made me realize that music had to be part of the story. And then it actually became one of the biggest sources that I used was finding the story of Houston's demographic change, the way that different people, especially Brown and Black communities, grappled with race, you could hear it if you listened to Houston's music. So Lightning Hopkins wound up becoming one of the characters and it kind of shifted the story, but also kept me very interested in using music as one of the sources. Awesome, thank you for um, addressing that question in there. And, and also uh, any of the, the scholars, if you find a, a question in the chat that you want to definitely address, please feel free to do that. Um, we, we definitely want to hear your thoughts on that as well. Um, I do have a very fun one, um, uh, a very fun one, a very light one for you guys. We, we've gotten pretty deep on here. Uh, so I have a very fun question for you. Um, <clears throat> it might just boil down to personal preference. Um, so amongst all of this research that you're doing, I, I would like to hope, I hope, and I would think that you all would like to read for fun. And so if you're, if you are reading for fun, I would like to know for, from each of you, do you uh, prefer a physical book, an audio book, or an e-book, and why? Teresa, let's start with you. All right, I'm just making sure I was unmuted. Um, I am, and I say this to my students, I am the dinosaur that needs the physical book. I like to be able to write in it. I am an obsessive margin writer. <laughs> um, and typically, 
you know, you'll see me around with a pencil and eraser. I typically only write in pencil when I'm in my books, but all of my books have margin annotations and I, I, yeah, I need a physical book most definitely, even though I, one of the things that I've been very conscious about doing um, in my classes, um, especially with, you know, uh, the pandemic and the access to more ebooks is having the option for my students to be able to get a book that's accessible through the library digitally. Because let's face it, times are economically tough for a lot of students with rising costs. But at the end of the day, I still prefer the written, the hard, hard copy. Anybody else want to go ahead and take take that? No particular order. I'll go quickly and say same. Um, prefer that most of the time the written one. I do like ebooks, and I've been buying more history books on ebook just for traveling um, and not having to sh like. I remember the battle days. I would always travel with like suitcases full of books, and I try to avoid that now. <laughs> so the ebook has that purpose. Uh, but yeah, you can't really tear it apart the same way that you can a print one. Yeah, same. I I do prefer the hard copy of a book. There just is nothing like snuggling up on the couch with the book and, <laughs> you know, just kind of digging through it and turning the smell of the paper and all of that. I, I still really love, but I, I also agree that it's so convenient to have ebooks travel, especially also for teaching. I can load them on my iPad, and my iPad is so light that I can have all the books, for example, that my students are dealing with in any particular time on there. And I also just discovered the Apple Pencil, so I can mark it up with the Apple Pencil and then actually erase it if I want to change my mind on something. So I've been experimenting with that a lot more lately, and I do enjoy the convenience of it. So, you know, and that's and that's funny because there's that similarity between all of you all that actually I'm glad I share because I, too, like just to get the actual physical book and I'll be, you'll be able to write in the margins. And I actually go back to the book after I've experienced life a little bit and kind of say, do I still feel the same way about this? And if I do, I was like, oh, OK, this is interesting. But sometimes I feel like life has kind of changed my perspective on certain things. And, and when I reread some key points, I'm like, why did I think that? What was going on in my life? So, yeah, I like to do that for, for my own self uh, awareness and reflection. <clears throat> So, so thank you for that. Um, so let's talk, let's go back to the actual pieces of work that, that we're talking about here, because um, we're at 415 and I want to get into some more of the deeper questions. I wanted to ask that light one to kind of break up uh, some of the, uh, the, the deep rooted conversations that we're having. So um, let's talk about surprises. Can you all articulate what were some of the biggest surprises you encountered when you were doing research for your respective books that we're talking about today. And uh, let's start with uh, with Max. All right. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm not. I'm, that's a hard one, actually. I think you know our our book, this this project, right, was very much, a, and for me at least, an outgrowth from the work I've been doing for Blue Texas, the work I've been doing for my teaching. And we knew when we went out and interviewed all these people, we would find out all sorts of new things, right? Um, so we learned in the book a lot about sort of the interior life of both black and Latinx communities, you know, behind, behind the veil across the color line, um, as Tawana was talking about. Um, you know, so what was Jim Crow like? What was Juan Crow like in an interior sense, as well as, as, well as you know, across the color line, its interactions with, with white supremacy? Um, you know, I think I think one thing we learned, um, and maybe it shouldn't have been a surprise, but was the you know just ubiquitous nature of state-sanctioned racial violence, and um, and how prevalent it was in so many forms everywhere in Texas, um, and of course you know that so many 
you know, activists came into what we might think of as the civil rights movement for these, um, you know, for that very basic sense of preserving their safety, their bodily integrity. And, um, and that was deep and I think hard to reckon with. Um, you know, as someone who's an activist myself, right, I think about politics, I, I'm interested in, um, you know, in community organizing and labor, sort of regardless, but I think it's sort of the deeply personal ways in which people came to um, confront the, the fear that they were trained <laughs> to, to inhabit, right, and, and the reality Right, that they could lose their lives for speaking up. Um, I found that to be incredibly powerful uh, and that we, we saw that from a number of different people that we interviewed. And then of course, those struggles against racial violence, it, whether it's police brutality or, or other forms, um, you know, end up dovetailing very closely with what we might think of as more recognizable civil rights struggles, the sit-ins, the marches, the electoral politics, uh, the labor struggles. Um, so yeah, I definitely learned a lot from, from doing this work and from, from the, the, the students who did the work with me, right? Everybody doing research in different places and we'd get together and share ideas and share stories, share what we'd learned. Um, I guess the last thing I'd mention is that, you know, again, this maybe wasn't entirely unanticipated, but as a researcher, it's really hard to talk to people when they're sharing these stories with you. Um, I think the experience of, um, learning about their trauma um, proved to be really challenging um, and really difficult for us uh, as a research team. And um, yeah, you know, I, I think these are the, 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 the sort of seriousness, the depth uh, of, of human, <laughs> I don't know, emotion and experience that we got to learn about that people, you know, generously shared with their, their lives with us. Um, it was really, really overwhelming at times. For sharing that, uh, Max. Uh, how about you, Tawana? Uh oh, I think you might be on mute again. You know, you would think that after using so much Zoom all the time that I would be used to turning my phone off and on <laughs> better safe than sorry i've done it millions of times safe than sorry well you know um one of the things uh for me with houston bound was that i felt that not enough of the works on race were really interrogating the meaning of these racial categories themselves and so a question that i had when i was even thinking about writing about Houston was that Texas in of itself, as Max has talked about as well and what he shows and a lot of his work is that depending on where you are in the state, segregation could mean a different thing. You know, and I think that he and I and a lot of people who were coming along writing about Texas right around the same time, our books kind of came out within the same period. So now there's a good body of work that really shows the complicated nature of race in Texas. But when we first started writing, I don't think there was a lot out there besides the person I mentioned earlier, Neil Foley. And so a, a way that I wanted to kind of get in and complicate what race even meant was by, you know, we throw around the term a lot that race is a construction, right? That um, race is not biological that it's often based on physical ideas of physicality, what people look like, but that these, uh, when race laws get written uh, by local governments, by state governments, there are all of these ambiguities that go on in how we consider race. So then I was very interested in getting at these very questions of what does the category of black even mean? in Texas during the Jim Crow era? What does the category of white mean? And what happens when you have people who come in who don't have those same ideas about black and white, right? So I felt that a lot of the books I was reading took for granted what racial categories even were, right? Like, oh, we all know what black means, right? You know black when you see it. 
but in a place like Houston being a Gulf Coast city and having that relationship to Louisiana, then you have people who were from Louisiana who did not, whose race was not very um, detectable just at first sight. So I, was, I got into the idea of racial ambiguity people who are who look to be a mixture of different things and with creoles of color in louisiana historically they thought of themselves as their own race you know uh, there was a moment in louisiana with it being a french colony as well as a spanish colony where in 18th century and early 19th century they were descendants of free people of color who were their own racial category and that wasn't recognized in Houston when they moved there. So I that got me interested in these ideas of race formation, even, and how just crossing the Sabine River, going from rural southwestern Louisiana into a place like Houston, the notion of what Black meant could change just in a short geographic area. And as I alluded to earlier, the same thing is happening with people of Mexican descent, whether they were Tejano or whether they were from Mexico, they're bringing these different constructions of race and what it meant into Houston. And so as I started doing this, I realized that, oh, that's a field of study called race formation history, that there are people who are out there talking about it. But I found a lot of that work really centered around whiteness and the question of what whiteness was. There were books written about Irish immigrants and their relationship to whiteness and Italian immigrants and their relationship to whiteness. And I thought, well, why aren't we doing that with blackness? We're assuming that blackness just means one thing all the time. And it really doesn't, right? People from Mexico came with their notions of what blackness meant that could be different from what was going on in Houston in the Jim Crow era. So I wound up just kind of accidentally stumbling into this uh, idea of race formation and writing toward that history. And when I started the project, I wouldn't have thought of myself. I didn't come at it as I'm a race formation historian, but kind of wound up being that. And it's something that's carried through in my more recent projects as well as just instead of taking for granted that we know what the categories mean that we use to break the categories down and try to pick them apart and get into the meaning of how we got to that category in the first place, rather than assuming everybody has the same understanding of what these labels mean. And for me, that's starting to carry forward into my newer work as well, which has more of a gender aspect to it than my first book did. But yeah, breaking down categories and that sort of thing, kind of something I came into, but that really became kind of the um, emphasis of my work. Thank you so much for that, Tawana. Um, Teresa, we'll get to you in just a moment, but I just wanted to take a quick pivot pause here. Um, I know time flies when you're having fun, and I know Max is going to have to drop off on us here uh, momentarily. So if any of the scholars had anything that they wanted to ask him or any of the participants, now would be the most appropriate time, and then we'll follow up with um, uh, Max if you have any additional words that you want to say to the audience and also how we can learn more about you. Uh, we'll do that at this time. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I don't know if anyone had questions, but it's been wonderful to be here. I'm sorry I have to dip out a little early. Um, and yeah, I, I uh, you know, it, I think what Tawana was just saying is really on point and so important, right? That we, you know, we need to make sure we remember that these are constructed and that they're historically constructed, which means that they shift over time. And so, um, you know, looking at the specific ways in which, you know, people confronted Jim Crow in the 40s and 50s as compared to the way the black power and Chicano power movements organized by the 1970s, right? There's a huge amount of difference, not just in the tactics, right? But in the larger structures surrounding them, including sometimes, right? The categories themselves and where people see themselves and identify in them. So thank you, that's a really important uh, point. Um, yeah, no, it's wonderful to be here with Intellectuel once again and um, to hear about some colleagues and their wonderful work. If you want to find me, you can go to professormax.org. Um, we also have the Civil Rights and Black and Brown Oral History Project website. So if you just Google that or it's crbb.tcu.edu, 
And, uh, and you have access to all of our sources or many of them. We have almost 8,000 clips on the website um, and you should be able to find exactly what you're looking for. And, and if you find yourself using them and writing a paper or making a podcast or whatever, I'd love to hear from, from you. So send me a note and uh, let me know what you're up to. And, and yeah, the book will be out in just a few weeks. Um, we, we're fortunate we get to promote it at the Texas Book Festival in Austin at the end of the month. And, um, and we're actually, if someone wants to know more, uh, today in the Sunday Houston Chronicle, there's a, a, an, an essay that's excerpted from one of the chapters by Samantha Rodriguez, one of our contributors. So check out today's Houston Chronicle and you can learn about the life of Maria Jimenez, uh, who was one of the many people we, we interviewed and Samantha's excellent chapter um, in, includes that that as well. So um, yeah, it, it, it was a collaborative project. We have all these people who are gonna be putting out new stuff from it. And I'm I'm very excited that, that in addition to documenting these stories, we have a whole crop of wonderful new scholars who are, um, are putting out great work, you know, that builds upon it. And um, as Tawana has suggested, right, this is a collective enterprise <laughs> when we do history, um, right? Uh, we all sort of, I think we didn't meet until our books came out uh, or right as they were impressed, Tawana, but like, um, you know, we're, we're collectively trying to get these stories uh, out into the world. We're, we're, you know, we're trying to, to do truth and reconciliation, right, with our past and, um, and move toward, you know, a more just future. And so uh, I'd love to hear from anybody working on that and, um, and continue the conversation with you all again sometime soon, I hope. Thank you so much, Max. We appreciate your time and, and spending a few moments here with us with your labor of love and, and everything with um, the civil rights and, and black and brown histories of resilience struggle in Texas. I most certainly will be looking into that myself and look forward to um, continuing the conversation with you offline. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and resume the conversation. So Teresa, let's talk about surprises um, during your, um, um, your, your, the research for your book, um, um, Jack with Jack Johnson. Um, I had this moment in the archives. I was in the British library and I was looking up reactions to the prize fight film between, uh, Jim Jeffries, who, if you've ever heard of the phrase, the great white hope, it comes out of the desire to find a white boxer to unseat Jack Johnson, who was then the world heavyweight champion. They fought each other in 1910, um, uh, actually on um, Independence Day, 1910. And much to the, the sorrow of all the white fans who had been hoping for this great white hope to not um, Jim Jeffries ends up losing. And part of the issue was it was captured on film. And at that time, uh, film technology was still pretty rudimentary, uh, but boxing was a really good subject for film because you could just set up your cameras in a couple of different spots and get all of the action. Um, and you didn't necessarily need to have a uh, you know, soundtrack to it because films were still silent in the 1910s. So you could actually take that film and transport it across state lines. You could transport it uh, to different continents and play it um, and show Jack Johnson in all of his glory knocking out Jim Jeffries. And you could put your own soundtrack in your own language on top of it um, and have somebody talking about the fight. So one of the things that I began to find in the archives was in city after city, particularly in the British imperial world. So we're talking um, everywhere from the heart of the empire in London to uh, cities in South Africa, um, to places in the white settler nations of Canada and Australia. Uh, to island nations like Jamaica, to the Philippines, to India, there were all of these movements to try and suppress the distribution and the staging of that film for non-white audiences. 
because the fear was that if you know this sort of violation of um you know the great white hope was shown in a space like for example cape town or johannesburg or manila <laughs> that um you know uh non-white people black and non-black would then suddenly realize i mean as if they needed this fight to suddenly realize that white supremacy was real but that um but that you know that this would somehow disrupt the balance of power in all of these different places and i i literally because i was in you know archives are very much constructed um in the context of power so in the british um, newspaper library they have newspapers from all across the british empire so i just started pulling you know july late july um in all of the different colonial spaces i could think of and in place after place after place they were like we must shut this down this is not acceptable we cannot have this happen um we cannot have a black man toppling a white man in the ring this will disrupt you know they were afraid that it would co um convince um you know black and brown men to uh cavort with white women they were afraid of you know um uh, people of color demanding their rights and demanding self determination i mean it was just wild that something as seemingly insignificant as a prize fight on these celluloid reels could cause this much of an uproar in so many different spaces and i think the flip side of that um was i discovered through all of my research um and particularly in reading against the grain and a lot of white newspapers globally that jack johnson had so many non-white fans all over the world and um you know sort of colonial uh observers would talk about you know young um young men gathering on the corners to reenact his fights in you know different spaces uh there were reports of the quote unquote native people of Fiji um you know rising up and suddenly becoming completely unruly <laughs> to all of the white people who were in in um Fiji at the time so it just really you know the fact that this one man you know who came from such humble beginnings in Galveston, Texas, who had no really no real clue that he was going to become this global figure is sparking conversations about racism, about um white supremacy, about whether or not, you know, folks should be segregated, about, you know, about the validity or legitimacy of colonialism. I was just blown away by um the degree to which people were following his story um and really you know thinking about all of these larger structural issues imperialism capitalism colonialism through something as simple as a fight and something as simple as a fight film um i think the other thing that really struck me was just how bittersweet jack johnson's story was and the story of jack johnson's fans i found so many instances of folks writing in the black press imagining that there was a space outside of the united states where white racism didn't exist and could they go there could they find it jack johnson himself when he's in exile after he gets um pushed out of the united states um and he's in exile from 1913 to 1920 you know he goes from place to place with such hope and such optimism that oh the british are going to treat me like a man but then he finds out no that's not going to happen then he goes to france and he thinks oh well paris of course paris is so much more 
um, progressive. But then he finds limitations there. And so he just goes from place to place to place. And the ultimate tragedy is that through all of that experience, he discovers that, you know, this thing that he thought was a local problem to his experiences growing up in the United States that he's been running from his whole life is ultimately a problem that's rooted in something much larger and that it's a global problem. And that to me was just, um, it was both, um, I don't know, epic, but also so tragic. Um, and I think that, that just the, the, those aspects of his story um, surprised me a lot. That's certainly deep. Um, I, you know, I, I did a little research on Jack Johnson preparing for it, for this, uh, for this interview. And I, but I, wow, I, said, I didn't know much about the man at all. And, and the, like you said, it was a bittersweet um, type of uh, situation for him, for sure. Um, so we have about a, you know, a few more moments. Uh, what I want to do is, uh, James put a, a question in the chat and I'll allow you ladies to answer that question. Um, what projects are you working on now? So I'm working on a couple of different projects. One that grew out of Houston down is when I started getting into the musical aspect of things more and looking at how central music and sometimes music companies were to Houston history, it led me to Peacock Records in Fifth Ward, founded by Don Rovey, who is a, a Houston entrepreneur, especially when it came to nightlife. He'd owned a few nightclubs before. I uh, had a nightclub called the Harlem Grill, one called the Bronze Peacock. And then he opens this record label called Peacock Records. Uh, he gets so successful that he actually even buys the roster of, or buys another record company out of Memphis that was called uh, Duke Records. And he puts it together to form Duke Peacock. And so I started digging around and learning more and more about Peacock. Something I remember from family stories, but I'd never actually researched. But I started finding that the story of Peacock didn't exactly fit with what I was talking about in Houston Bound. It, it wasn't so much about that, that story of race formation and community building. I started actually looking at how many of his artists were LGBTQ+, and, and started putting it all together. Uh, for example, Little Richard was first signed to Peacock. He didn't have a lot of success during his Houston, his brief stint in Houston. He ends up finding more success recording in New Orleans. So he leaves Houston, goes uh, east to New Orleans. But there was a period of time when he was with Peacock. Also, uh, there was a transgender man who was a gospel singer there at Peacock, Wilmer Broadnax, known as Little Axe. People at the time did not know that Broadnax was assigned female at birth. They all knew him as part of a gospel quartet of young men. And then you also had Willie Mae Big Mama Thornton, who wasn't, I don't think she ever publicly identified as being a lesbian or bisexual, but it was something about her that was always rumored these rumors always were part of her career and also the way that she dressed kind of subverted these ideas of 50s femininity. And what started with it started with Big Mama, especially making me wanted to dig into it, was I have this old family photo of her with my grandfather in Fifth Ward in the late 40s or early 50s, and they're dressed the same. As James put in the comments, she wore suits, right? Yes, they're both wearing ties. They've got the shiny Oxford shoes on, their hair slipped back in a conch, what they used to call it back then. So she and my dad have this, and my granddad have the same gender presentation. They're both dressed in a very masculine way. And when I started digging into it, I found that this was very controversial 
in the 1950s during the Cold War when there were expectations about what femininity looked like. And so I started this by giving a presentation on this picture and talking about how a picture can lead you to historical questions. And I got so much feedback that I thought, hmm, maybe this is an article. So I wrote an article about kind of early Peacock and all of these artists. And I used the analytical category of queer, meaning ways that our non-normative gender presentation as well as same-sex desire, that these two things could all fall under the umbrella of what academics sometimes call queer histories. And so I wrote that article, but then people, when I would present on it, kept asking me for more. They would say, well, how did the story go into the 60s? You talked about the 50s. And also, if we think about 90s R&B, can't you see some of that Big Mama Thornton influence with the girl groups who were all blending their music with hip hop and were all wearing the baggy jeans? So I started thinking, this is a bigger story. <laughs> so right now, uh, what started with Peacock Records in the 50s is growing into a broader history of, the, of rhythm and blues music that really looks at the way that rhythm and blues artists over time have kind of toyed with ideas about gender in their music and have always kind of uh, part of the rebellion of rhythm and blues and all of its offshoots is that you can kind of trace the ways that gender has changed in black and brown societies by looking at the gender presentation of some of the rhythm and blues artists. So it turned into a, a bigger project from there. Yes, at groups like TLC, they even had a song where they addressed the fact that people would say, y'all look like boys. <laughs> Escape ran into the same controversy at around the same time. So these people who kind of mess around with what gender looks like from Rick James with his veins and long braids and all sorts of things throughout the history of rhythm and blues, the disco days, friends, of course, I felt like there was a, a bigger story. And so this book isn't going to be a traditional academic book. It actually is aimed toward a trade audience. And so I'm having to write this in different ways. So I'm building on things. Yes, I'm using the theory of queerness that a lot of academics have used, but I have to discuss this in a way that someone who is not a college professor or a grad student would pick up and be interested in and still get that theory. So, yeah, it sounds like it's, it's plenty and you're, you're pretty motivated about it. And I, and I, and I definitely um, I'm looking forward to, to see a little bit more about that and, and those endeavors. Teresa, let's, what about you? Uh, what are some things that you're working on? So right now I really only have one project that I'm working on um, and sometimes not working on it. Um, I'm sure that everybody has experienced the pandemic in various ways, but it has meant the stoppage of childcare and all sorts of things. So this has been really um, a book that I've been working on and just trying to, to fit into life, <laughs> so to speak. Um, but it's tentatively titled uh, Black Ball. And I use that in like as a way of talking about blackballing and the fact that um, African Americans also, I think, created a new genre of basketball. Um, it's called Blackball: The Struggle for the Soul of Basketball in the 70s. So I'm really going from the late 60s right up until the early 80s and covering that decade that's often overlooked when there were all sorts of um, transformations happening in particularly professional basketball, but also pro sports more broadly speaking. So with desegregation of uh, the college game, um, with the emergence of a competing league called the American Basketball Association, it opened up space for more black professional basketball players um, and you see the leagues the professional leagues go from being maybe um, 30 to 50 percent african-american to being you know upwards of three quarters black 
by the end of the decade. So I really wanted to ask, like, what happens with that transition? I think a lot of times when we tell stories about sport, we're looking at the racial pioneers who sort of, um, you know, bring down the color line in sports. So my question was, what happens after? <laughs> what happens after um, sport has desegregated? What happens after um, the big movement in the late 1960s called the Revolt of the Black Athlete, where Black athletes were asserting um, that they no longer wanted to be sort of empty symbols um, in the sporting arena and that, you know, they wanted um, the broader public to realize that racism impacted um, not just their life uh, within the sport, but also outside of the sport. Um, so I look at um, some familiar uh, folks and some not so familiar folks. So I start with Connie Hawkins, um, who was blackballed by the NBA for years for his alleged uh, uh, involvement in a gambling uh, game fixing scandal. And of course, he was not actually involved, um, but nonetheless, uh, the NBA, you know, refused to allow him to be drafted onto teams and they collude, the, the league essentially colluded to keep him out of basketball. And so he went to court and he said, this is uh, um, an antitrust violation. You are, you know, colluding to keep me out of the industry. Um, and he ends up, um, you know, getting a settlement and ends up uh, being able to play in the NBA. Um, and what comes after that is a series of antitrust um, cases against the NBA that really radically reshape the relationship between the players and the owners, um, eventually leading to um, the uh, gradual dismantling of the reserve clause. So it used to be you would be drafted onto a team and that team had uh, basically power over you. <laughs> they could determine when you were gonna get cut, when you were gonna get traded, you could not sort of go on the free market as a free agent once your contract was over to try and get a contract with a new team. They had perpetual rights to your labor. Um, and so that fight in the early 70s was really led by black players who understood that there were echoes of bondage <laughs> in this system. Um, and they really um, spearheaded the fight to get rid of the reserve clause in professional basketball. They changed the game um, on the court, bringing uh, black style from, um, from HBCUs, um, folks like Earl the Pearl Monroe, you have Dr. J emerging in this period and really reshaping how basketball is played. And a lot of, the, we, we forget that actually the, the white fans who were the, you know, fan base of professional basketball in the 70s was still majority white. And uh, the league sort of catered to that majority white fan base. And, you know, the moves that we now think of as quintessential NBA basketball were actually, you know, uh, criticized by fans criticized by coaches at the time as not the proper way to play basketball, that they were too showy, that uh, they weren't about the team and about fundamentals. Um, and so you see a kind of discussion about race through the style of play on the court. Um, I also look at the emergence of black coaches and uh, black front office professionals um, in this period. And then, you know, the last part of the book really looks at what we've often called the dark ages of um, the NBA. So the typical narrative of the late 70s is that it became too violent. There were too many fights on the court and that the players were all taking cocaine. So it was a disaster. Um, and I sort of pull apart that narrative and say, OK, but why are people so obsessed about fighting on the court? Because it's not actually a new thing. 
But what is new is the fact that the players are 75% black. So what does that mean in the context of the late 70s, where we're also in the midst of an urban crisis, where we're thinking about how do we contain black youth in cities where, you know, sort of on the cusp of all sorts of legislation that leads to mass incarceration. Um, and then also too, you know, were they really all taking cocaine? Well, maybe, maybe they were dabbling, but were they all addicts? Probably not. You probably couldn't run a league if, if 80, some of the reports were they're 80% addicted to cocaine. So I just wanted to unpack the racial dimensions of that um, and really think about, you know, those narratives of the late 70s really exposing the fact that basketball had transformed so much that it um, had created this kind of backlash. And that backlash within basketball spoke to a larger backlash um, in U.S. society at large, particularly against Black youth. Um, and they sort of become, the basketball players become the way to talk about that. Um, so that's what I'm currently working on. Um, I'm hoping that I can pull it together and get it done by the deadline. Um, and, you know, I, I, one of the things that happened with the pandemic was I couldn't quite do the research that I wanted to do because everything shut down. And, um, but nonetheless, you know, there is so much material out there that maybe I sort of saved myself. <laughs> from over-researching the book in some ways um, because of the limitations of having to be at home. Um, but there's a lot of exciting stories that I was able to find. Um, and I think these guys, they really, they really are, you know, um, they should have their due. Um, and I'm hoping that this book um, helps to really place them in the context of the Black Freedom Movement um, more generally speaking. That's, that's awesome. And, you know, I'm so glad that you both, you know, um, to wonder with you in the, um, in the, in the music artistry space, uh, being able to explore some different things. And then you, Teresa, with, with athletics, where you both had a passion prior to that, you know, you guys can go back into it and continue to explore that for your, for your respective audiences. All right, so I'm going to ask one question, and um, as we're running down with time, I'll, I'll ask you to limit it to just to one minute. It's going to be difficult. One minute before I uh, before I uh, give it to our our VP of Marketing here. Um, what is uh, what is the one what what is the deeper meaning or one thing that you want the audience to take away from your respective writings um, that we spoke about today? Um, what what is that thing that you hope that they get from reading the book, um, and, and something for them to continue to process as as they continue on um, reading and researching um, in these respective genres? I can take a stab at it first. Okay. Uh, that. I would say when I first started writing Houston Bound, I got a lot of pushback. I started with professors, people who thought, why Houston? There's so many other more interesting places. And I thought, well, this is probably why Houston's history hadn't been written by a, a lot of people. It's such a big city, but comparatively didn't have a lot of work on it. So I would say every place has a history. It could be even a place that you grew up in or your parents or grandparents grew up in. It doesn't matter how big or how small it is or if anybody's ever paid attention to it. Every local story can teach us something about our society and about the people who live there. So I don't think that a place has to be recognized by other people as important. You can make the story important yourself and you know you don't have to be famous even to have an important piece in our histories whether it's a local history that i wrote an international history like Teresa wrote everyone has a story that is relevant and should be told thank you Teresa. i don't know if i can add much to that that, that was so beautifully said um, I, I would say that 
anyone can make an impact. I think a lot of the folks who I study were just regular people who maybe had a talent in something or had a moment where they had a platform and took the risk of saying something or contributing to a conversation and that, you know, yeah, anyone can make an impact. Anyone can be a, an activist of a, of, you know, of a different kind, um, of various kinds. Um, and that everything, don't ever let anyone tell you that something isn't political. <laughs> everything is political. It's just, you know, who, um, who is allowed to be quote unquote political and, and how you're allowed to be political. So always interrogate that. Um, there's always opportunities um, to think about, uh, you know, the deeper implications of something, even if it's just a video game or a sporting event or a song. Um, there is always something that you can um, learn from scratching the surface. Well said. Well, ladies, thank you so very much for, for the opportunity to, do, to speak with you these few moments. I, uh, I will say for myself, I am certainly the recipient of all the value on today's discussion. So um, again, I thank you. And at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to our board member and VP of marketing, uh, Tina Stansel. Thank you, Pat. And thank you so much to our scholars. I, I've learned so much. I'm always inspired to hear um, from our from scholars that we invite to talk about their work and their, their past work and their upcoming work. So I thank you so much for, for your time today. And I think um, I'm, I'm excited to share these sessions with folks who weren't able to join. So I'm so glad we were able to record them and um, you know share with an even broader audience. So um, just to close this out, we wanted to just um, announce some upcoming or our next event for Intellectual. So I'm gonna just quickly um, share my screen and I'm gonna ask James to just say, uh, a word or two about this next event that we have coming up. All right. Um, wow. Yeah, this was outstanding. Thank you so much, Teresa and Tawana, um, for participating today. And man, let's give a shout out to Pat Rump. Brother Pat did an outstanding job as a moderator today. We got to give it up to 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 him there. Um, so we do Nature by the Book with Intellectual, which is a partnership with Outdoor Afro, the Houston Network of Outdoor Afro. Um, Outdoor Afro, for those who may not be aware, is a national organization that seeks to uh, uh, connect or reconnect, as you would, um, Black people, African American, and people of color in general uh, with outdoors, ecology, and nature. So we partner with the uh, Houston Network, and twice a year, we uh, do a book talk called Nature by the Book. Um, the most recent one we did was Stick Stones, Roots and Bones, where we talked about African herbalism um, and uh, di diasporic um, uh, tra traditions uh, that passed down from Africa, hoodoo, voodoo, and, you know, et cetera. Um, and the next one that we're going to do is in January. And we're going to be uh, talking about Harriet Washington's book, A Terrible Thing to Waste. If you're not familiar with this book of hers, you're probably familiar with her uh, critically acclaimed book, uh, Medical Apartheid. And so environmental uh, racism since Flint, the Flint situation, people are talking a lot more about it, but it's, there's been many, many issues and things uh, with environmental racism before then and even after then. And we have some local issues here in Houston um, that we're gonna be talking about. So we're gonna be, we're gonna be uh, reading this book and discussing it in January. The final date hasn't been set yet. But this is a, an in-person event. Um, so we're gonna be in a local area. We're gonna have some of the local organizations that um, um, relate to uh, environmental issues and black and brown communities present as well. And so those of you who are local here, we would love to have you come out and participate in that. We'd also love you to uh, follow Intellectual on Eventbrite. You can go to uh, all our social media. We're on Twitter, uh, uh, Instagram, LinkedIn, across the board. Uh, oh, Tanya just flipped over here, of course. <laughs> those of you who are, who are interested, you can go to our merchandise store as well at intellectual.org or through Bonfire and purchase some of our um, items that we have for sale, uh, representing some of our different projects that we do. Um, one of them, Max is not on there, but we have something for our Houston Youth uh, Power Research Project that we're gonna be working on that he helped us uh, establish. And Tawan, I mentioned that to you a little bit earlier. 
we've got some things going there. So you can, you know, you pick up some of those things up here. You can see uh, our doggone Sirius, which is going back to the African Dogon tribe, um, um, trying to get young people and people in general of color more involved in astronomy and astrophysics. So uh, we, we're very uh, into reading advocacy, but we're also involved with media literacy, digital citizenship, and academic achievement in general with intellectual. Um, so, any other slides you're gonna you're gonna put up there for me, Tanya? Is that is that it? That's it. That covers it. <laughs> All right, good stuff. Thank you, everyone. I'm gonna turn it back over to our VP of Marketing. Okay. Well, that that closes us out today. Again, just thank you so much to our scholars, and thank you to Pat Runt for doing an excellent job leading the conversation.